Hello, friends, and welcome to the Sunday Special. My name is James Fisher. This is going to be Sunday Special episode 16, and we've got something very fun for you guys. We always try to do something a little bit different, and this time we're going in the way back machine, all the way to 1994. Now, some of you don't even know what 1994 was, but for us older gamers who cut our teeth on Dragon Warrior and the original Final Fantasy, this will be a prime year for you. Myself, I was 13. I probably would end up being about 14 when a very important game in my life came out. We knew it at the time as Final Fantasy 3. We would later know it as Final Fantasy 6. And uh, we've got an article kind of detailing one man's perspective of that game. And that is Ted Woolsey. And if you don't know who that is, you're going to learn. As we have an article by Nadia Oxford. She is a staff writer for usgamer.net. And she wrote an excellent article uh, talking about the history of Final Fantasy VI. As well as Woolsey's translation on that game. It is... In a word, legendary. And we'll talk all about that. We'll take a quick break, and then I will give you that full interview here on the Sunday Special. Every RPG enthusiast can recall what game they were playing when they were struck by the fandom's universal epiphany. The realization that RPGs can treat us to rich stories and deep character rosters that rival classic fantasy novels. We don't say it often enough, but the people who translated those games and add flavor to the characters, stories, and worlds deserve some credit for these discoveries. It's fine to journey for 60 hours with wooden heroes. It's better to come away with the adventure, bright-eyed, and stuff full of one-liners like, Don't tease the octopus, kids. And you sound like a chapter from a self-help booklet. The 16-bit era was a renaissance for console RPGs, especially for Westerners. Though RPGs wouldn't reach anything close to the mainstream popularity until Final Fantasy VII hit the PlayStation in 1997, the candy-colored sprites of Secret of Mana and the solemn, realistic backdrops of Final Fantasy VI, released in the West as Final Fantasy III, turned some heads and won some hearts. In time, these newly baptized RPG fans and the veterans who fell in love with the genre through Dragon Warrior came to the same observation. Many of the RPGs produced by Square Enix, at the time Squaresoft, boasted next-level translations in an era where video game localizations were still infamous for being shoddy. Squaresoft's RPGs were, weren't just clear and co competent. They built up the worlds they belonged to, gave life to character and hero and monster alike. In particular, the localization of Final Fantasy VI is so ingrained in fans' minds that certain character quirks and bits of dialogue have carried over into modern Final Fantasy games. Professional authors even cite FF6 as a major inspiration for their work. It's remarkable to realize Square Enix's ability to deliver such a powerful story about death, devastation, and then the world, while under the watchful eye of Nintendo of America's concert sensors, content sensors. That's why the man behind the translation, Ted Woolsey, is still celebrated for his work. There are slings and arrows too, however. The war between people who prefer colorful, highly localized interpretation of Japanese content and the people who prefer straight translations is as old as the internet fandom. For the entirety of the 16-bit RPG renaissance and beyond, the liberty Woolsey take with Final Fantasy VI's translation was a hot battleground on Usenet, message boards, and RRC chat rooms. Woolsey joined Squaresoft's American office in Redmond, Washington in 1991. Final Fantasy IV had just been released in the U.S. as Final Fantasy II. It was one of the biggest and most ambitious RPGs to exist on the SNS at the time. Its story took players across a vast world before it plunged down to an underground land, and then shot for the moon. Unfortunately, the epic atmosphere of FF4's journey was damaged when it came to the West. 
Thanks to a translation poor, so poor, it still leaves an infamy. And sure, Final Fantasy IV gave us the wonderful, baffling scene of an antagonizing father crying, You spoony bard! Before launching himself at the said bard for letting his daughter come to harm. But for the most part, Final Fantasy IV's SNES translation was full of broken sentences, grammatical errors galore, and strange glitches. The translation wasn't just an, wasn't just unpleasant to read, it was unpleasant to produce, which was why Wolseley was brought into head localizations. Before he arrived, localizing games was a catch as catch can task at Squaresoft, and several unusual writers contributed to the pod. I think the process of finalizing the screen text had been so painful, even the finance lead and at office admin worked to rewrite slash edit the script until it passed certification in Nintendo of America. That Square actively searched for some options to improve things, Woolsey told the writer over an email. When Woolsey began working with Squaresoft, he wasn't necessarily a fan of console RPGs. He'd played King's Quest and similar PC RPGs, but it immediately noticed that the work of Final Fantasy IV quote, tasted like something fundamentally different, unquote. Howled by the scope of Squaresoft's stories, he was determined to do them justice with the translations. His first job was Final Fantasy Legend III for the Game Boy, which is actually a saga game that was localized under the Final Fantasy banner for the sake of name recognition. It was, He says it was a surprisingly long script with tons of complexity for a Game Boy product, and I learned much from my mistakes, Woolsey says. I think that that title... I think on that title, I started to get deeper into the narrative voices, opportunities to play with the humor, and how to spot scatological humor that wouldn't pass muster in Nintendo of America. You probably won't find many localizers today who boast the ability to competently rewrite poop jokes on their resume, but it was a vital skill for anyone localizing games in the 90s for Nintendo of America. Before the implementation of the ESRB in late 1994, Nintendo of America was strict about keeping this game family-friendly. It became especially fastidious when Mortal Kombat's over-the-top fatalities caused the media and the United States government to wring its hands over violence and other inappropriate video game content. Professional localizer Clyde Mendelin has a comprehensive list of content considered uh, Vervodium by Nintendo's early 1990s localization standards. Bloody violence on the level of Mortal Kombat was obviously out, but Nintendo's no-no list also forbade nudity slash sexual acts, swearing, religious imagery or terminology, i.e. God, Satan, Buddha, Hell, etc., and any depiction of use of drugs or alcohol. Squaresoft's 16-bit RPGs aren't necessarily bloody, but they contain plenty of mild swearing and the occasional bare bum. If you look at Madeline's list of forbidden Nintendo content, you can see a specific example of how FF6 was altered when it came to the West. Siren, an esper who can be summoned by the good guys to put monsters to sleep, is airing her butt cheeks in the game's Japanese art, and she was covered up for North America. Final Fantasy VI doesn't have flagrant nudity everywhere, but it is one of Square Enix's most mature works. Though the story starts with a typical narrative about a power-hungry empire, everything spirals out of control and the world literally ends. Innumerable people, innumerable people die. Kefka, the insane cloud god clown ruling over the ruins of the world, only wishes to snuff out every life still scrambling for sustenance in his broken kingdom. One by one, Final Fantasy VI cast struggles to find its purpose in a seemingly hopeless universe. Major parts of Final Fantasy VI's storyline involve suicide, teen pregnancy, and mass slaughter. Its length, depth, and gravity make it a difficult translation under the best conditions. But when Final Fantasy VI was being localized, 
Nintendo disallowed words like die and death. Ted Woolsey was expected to tell North American audiences a story about the apocalypse, but he had to do it without inferring that anyone actually dies. We see poor little NPC characters, sprites getting stabbed, choke on poison, fall into chasms, and even get squished between tectonic plates when a piece of earth heaves to life and launches skyward. But they're not dead. They're doomed. They've passed on. When your party falls in battle, they're annihilated. It was okay for Final Fantasy VI's translation to suggest the party had been obliterated. What matters is that they didn't die. I asked Woolsey a simple question about Final Fantasy VI's translation. How on earth did he manage? It's no surprise. Translating Final Fantasy VI wasn't easy. Woolsey started the job by getting to know the characters, which inspired him to do right by them. Quote, I played as much of the game as I could to get a sense of the scope. I felt a connection to the characters, and when I began translating, it felt as though I were channeling their personalities, enjoying their fobbles as well as pitfalls as I proceeded, he says. In the end, I grew to care about the game in a very personal way. They made me want to try and keep producing better work, a credit to the creative teams at Square. As he played, Woolsey was able to identify some of their narrative arcs that probably wouldn't get through Nintendo of America's content filter. He devised ways around them whenever possible. Quote, I wanted to pull as much of the drama in as possible to try and retain what I could the more shocking events in the games, he says. I did my best to try and find alternatives and work around some of these blockers. Woolsey found some interesting ways to make Final Fantasy VI's startling moments more appropriate for Western audiences. And it's interesting to look back on Nintendo gave a pass. A, a subplot involving a pregnant six-year-old and her terrified boyfriend can remain. As long as Woolsey made the two a married couple, <laughs> the conflicted heroine Celeste was still allowed to attempt suicide when she hit a <laughs> when she hit her rock bottom in the second half of the game. As long as Woolsey made it seem as though she jumped to, quote, perk up. Uh-huh. Celeste's jump doesn't make sense in the context of the game either, but suicide was obviously a firm no in Nintendo of America's books. Woolsey did what he could, which forced him to come up with creative solutions for several despairing NPCs who likewise jumped to their deaths. Celis learned that these NPCs actually, quote, passed away from boredom and despair, unquote. This is another instance where the softened localization winds up being more disturbing than the source material. A quick end by suicide seems preferable to wasting away on a lonely island surrounded by poisoned water. It's like seeing your party annihilated versus telling you have just died. On the plus side, these weird oversights by Nintendo arguably made some of Final Fantasy VI's most intense moments that much more memorable for Western audiences. Whenever something did slip through that was naughty, it seared your brain. I distinctly remember visiting the, south, the town of South Fierga in the second half of the game and spotting a man and woman hiding among some trees. When you talk to the couple, the man says something to the effect of making their new lives to replace the ones lost. He runs off, and the woman falls. The NPCs aren't exactly undressed and filming at one another, but the implications are clear. I asked Woolsey how this interlude slipped under Nintendo's Hawkeye guy gaze. He admits the jumbled process of translating old RPGs made it easy for things to slip between the cracks. He says, quote, That scene is a good example of one of the issues of localizing a huge game composed of multiple discontinuous files. I probably had no idea what the context was for in that dialogue, and since the game was so big, it is possible NBC Exchange never made it to the VHS tapes. We had to accompany each submission to Nintendo of America. There were hundreds of short blurbs and asides like that in the text files, which led to some anxiety as well as translation gaffes. In retrospect, I'm glad the scene remained. 
A big part of Final Fantasy VI's message involves fighting back against darkness and despair. The Randy South Fierigo's gent celebrations of life isn't subtle, but his heart, or otherwise, is in the right place. Despite its long list of thou shall nots, Woolsey says Nintendo America wasn't necessarily his biggest hindrance in localizing the FS6, though he was asked to revise and resubmit parts of his localization more than once. Unfurling Final Fantasy VI's text from compact Japanese characters to the sprawling English alphabet required a lot of memory, the time when 32 made cartridge games were considered enormous and had a price tag to match. The hardest part of the game was the sheer size of the context versus what the Improm, erasable, programmable, read-only memory, could accommodate as far as memory, he says. At some point, I just had to dump this side-by-side Japanese and English translation and keep flipping sentences around and shortening things until they finally fit onto the ROM configuration. Woolsey hated to chop the script. He believes the game was poor because of it. Unfortunately, it was necessary. FX6 was still one of the most expensive Super Nintendo titles shipped in North America due to the memory capacity required to house the game, he says. That in itself was a barrier to entry for the game for mass market consumers. Indeed, it wasn't unusual for the for RPGs to sell close to $100 US. Fantasy Star 4, the Sega Genesis' best RPG, retailed for more than $80 US thanks to its hefty 24 megs of memory. There are several reasons why Final Fantasy VII successfully rebooted RPGs into the mainstream, and its CD format is undoubtedly one. The looser memory restrictions eliminated the need to build bigger cartridges, which in turn dramatically lowered the price of RPGs. Thankfully, Woolsey's work received a careful makeover with 2006 Final Fantasy VI for the Game Boy Advance. It did an excellent job of completing Woolsey's translations while retaining its charm. The translation was headed by Tom Slattery, who talked to RB Gamer about the process in a 2012 interview. Final Fantasy VI Advance is hard to find, but Clyde Mandel has a thorough breakdown that compares Woolsey's translation to the re-translation. Final Fantasy VI on mobile and Steam also uses the re-translation, though the game's upscaled sprites and backgrounds leave something to be desired. Woolsey's clever alterations to Final Fantasy VI's script and his dedication to the game's characters still echo in ways he never expected. As Woolsey admits himself, parts of FF6's translation are odd. Sentences often feel truncated, no doubt because of the strict memory limitations Woolsey worked within. Despite these problems, Woolsey's Final Fantasy VI translation built up characters like no other RPG at the time. His influence lingers. In Final Fantasy XIV, players can fight a manifestation of Kefka, who cackles about making a, quote, monument to non-existence, a line Woolsey penned for the Mad Clown in 1994. Even Woolsey's translation errors continue to influence the Final Fantasy series. Ultros, a giggling purple octopus with an irrepressible personality was born in FF6. Ultros' name is supposed to be Orthros, O-R-T-H-R-O-S, a reference to a two-headed dog monster from Greek mythology. But Woolsey gave Ultros a twisted sense of humor and ridiculous one-liners. Even now, the octopus usually keeps Woolsey's main <laughs> mistranslated name when he hops from game to game. Final Fantasy XIV server, named after him, retains the Ultros moniker. This Ultros slip is an example of a Woolseyism, a TV trope that refers to Woolsey's tendency to change RPG scripts, whether out of error, necessity, or narrative preference. Woolseyisms can often extend to any Japanese to English media and are generally regarded as a positive thing. Some of Final Fantasy VI's lines are so well integrated into the collective consciousness of the game that they have been embraced by the fandom instead of revealed. Revealed, states the TV Trop's entry on Woolseyisms. 
Woolsey of Chuffs is chuffed by his TV chops legacy. Very cool, of course, to read through, he says. Something that makes you seem smarter than you are. The TV Tropes page points out that not everyone is a fan of Woolseyisms. And Woolsey acknowledges that not everyone is a fan of his methods. Quote, I've had my critics, gamers, upset because I shortened or changed something, used a different name, etc., etc. He says, sometimes I just outright blew it, of course. I understand and respect the passion and criticism. I think it's a function of localizing something that becomes iconic over time. It's difficult to explain to a broader audience why this, why there isn't always a perfect or even reasonable one-one correlation between the original language and the target language. Not all of Woolsey's criticisms were deserved, however. RPG message boards in the late nineties and and early aughts lit up with the accusations of Woolsey censoring content and the games he translated. When the case was Nintendo made the rules, not Woolsey. In fact, Woolsey did what he could to prevent Nintendo's rules from warping Final Fantasy VI's story and dialogue. Unfortunately, it was difficult for critics to grasp the complicated compromises that went into translating the game. It was easier to just get angry and lob accusations across the internet. There is truly nothing new under the sun. He says, Yeah, there were some very angry people. I understood the passion. It would have been impossible to explain to everyone what the huge trade off with memory capacity were. We had a platform, the SNES, that came with rules and regulations that were in place and needed to be followed if we wanted to ship. I had to be pragmatic about it all. But of course, sometimes was taken aback by how volatile some of these attacks were. It's not fun to stand directly in a stream of fan venom. But Woolsey understands the fans' frustrations. He says, As I said, I think when people are deeply moved by these games and their experiences, they become defensive and inquisitive. I was one of the people between them and the, quote, authentic experience they hungered for. Woolsey currently works at the game studio Undead Labs as general manager, but he retains his love for localizations. I've never stopped missing it, he says. But localization has become a much more involved process since the 90s. He says, most games require studio work and script writing skills. Seems like for many larger games, they need more of a Hollywood-style writing crew to handle the production work and real-time edits demand, demanded during recording, he says. That's a world away from where I started, typing away in a quiet office. Social media still argues, sometimes rages, about the superiority of pure translations over more liberal localizations and vice versa. The discourse is a mess. It's a tire fire that'll never burn out, unless there's always a controversy to throw in the blaze. Ted Woolsey didn't start the fire, with apologies to Billy Joel, but his RPG translations, and his translation of Final Fantasy VI in particular, sparked the idea that game localizations can often be more than simple stories. They can sometimes offer akin to epics, interactive novels that you'll never forget. Even the content within has been scrubbed to meet a vague standard of purity. Woolsey might not be in the entry spotlight, like Hideo Kojama or Siguru Morimoto, but the mark he made on the JRPG genre during those days he spent typing away in a quiet office is undeniable. All right, guys, that's going to wrap up this JRPG Report Sunday special, episode 16. I hope you enjoyed this look back in time. As uh, It's just been fascinating to me to learn more about the games I experienced as a young gamer and really what went into these things. At all these years later, it's still... <laughs> has a place in my heart and I remember it fondly. So it's been really cool to go back and read some of these things and in particular about the translation that took place and what went into making these games, especially with the memory constraints that these producers had to work within on the cartridges. I don't think it could be possible in today's world where something like Final Fantasy VII Remake 
required two Blu-ray discs worth of information to tell a story which was a fraction of the entire game. It's truly mind-blowing. So I hope you have enjoyed it. Uh, Look forward to our regular uh, podcast on Wednesdays. And on Sundays, we'll always try to do something a little special and a little fun. My name is James Fisher, signing off for the JRPG Report. We see you guys again here real soon. But until then, get back out there and level up.